Being the best-selling fiction author of the 90s is a big deal. Writing 41 books in an internationally best-selling series is a big deal. Being the most shoplifted English author of all time, also a big deal. By those metrics, we could say Terry Pratchett is three big deals happening in the same trench coat, but he's actually far more complicated than that, as you're about to learn. As one of the first writers to make a habit of using the internet to communicate with their fans, we were able to draw from a wealth of his newsgroup posts to present you with this unfiltered view of Pratchett from Pratchett himself. Every Discworld fan owes a debt of gratitude to the librarians of the Beaconsfield Public Library in Buckinghamshire, England, for if they hadn't stoked the curiosity of a young Terry Pratchett, he might never have become a writer. Born on April 28, 1948, the only child of a mechanic and a secretary, he first experienced adversity at the hands of his peers and the crueler teachers at Holtzburg School. Bullied for a speech impediment, Pratchett spent as much time as he could in the library reading anything he got his hands on. When I was a kid, I read dictionaries all the way through. Dictionaries, thesauruses, dictionaries of slang, all that sort of thing for the sheer fun of doing it. I think I was a rather weird kid, to be frank. Another early source of fine literature came from his grandmother, who would go on to inspire one of his most famous characters, Granny Weatherwax. I was allowed to read from her bookshelf. It was a very short bookshelf, but it contained every book you really ought to read, like the complete short stories of H.G. Wells and the complete short stories of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. I just worked my way along my granny's bookshelf and didn't realize that I was getting an education. He published his first story at the age of 13 in his high school newspaper and continued to publish throughout the next few years. The early taste of journalism eventually motivated him to quit school at 17 and pursue employment with the Bucks Free Press, where he wrote a weekly column named Children's Circle. If you're curious about what his early work was like, many of those stories were later republished in the collection Dragons, Crumbling Castle, and other tales. Featuring hilarious illustrations by Bark Beach, it's ideal for younger readers or established Pratchett heads who enjoyed the comedic atmosphere of the first Discworld novels. From his start in 1965, he worked diligently until a chance encounter with one of the publishers of Colin Smythe Limited in 1968. Peter Bender Van Duren would eventually become one of Sir Terry's best friends, though neither of them could have imagined the literary empire they would build when they first sat down together for an interview. In the course of their discussion, Pratchett mentioned a novel he was working on, which Peter asked to read and eventually publish. 1971 saw Terry Pratchett turn 23 and release his first novel, The Carpet People. If you haven't heard of it, you're not alone. The first edition was received well, but failed to generate a lot of press. After his work took off, he eventually rewrote a second edition, and in the forward joked, this book had two authors, and they were both the same person. He then followed it up with two sci-fi novels, Dark Side of the Sun in 1976 and Strata in 1981. Both The Carpet People and Strata focus on flat planets, a central theme of the Discworld series. 1976 also saw the birth of his daughter Rihanna. She would go on to write several AAA video games like Mirror's Edge, Prince of Persia, and Bioshock Infinite. She is also co-director of Narrativia, the production company that handles adaptations of Sir Terry's works. He would eventually leave journalism for a position as a press officer with a group of nuclear power plants just four months after the Three Mile Island scandal. He often explains that decision by making a joke about his impeccable timing, but working so directly with nuclear professionals clearly left an impression about the importance of electricity and how fragile the nation's infrastructure really is. There's a particularly cutting quote from Good Omens about the terse relationship between the media and nuclear energy. It goes, Surely you have considered terrorist activity. There was another pause. Then the spokesman said, in the quiet tones of someone who has had enough and who is going to quit after this and raise chicken somewhere, Yes, I suppose we must. All we need to do is find some terrorists who are capable of taking an entire nuclear reactor out of its can while it's running and without anyone noticing. It weighs about a thousand tons and is 40 feet high, so they'll be quite strong terrorists. Perhaps you'd like to ring them up, sir, and ask them questions in that supercilious accusatory way of yours. He often said that he would write a book about his experiences if he thought anyone would believe them, but sadly he never did. Thank you. 
His next big break came in 1983 with the release of the first Discworld book, The Color of Magic, which placed 93rd in that year's Big Read. Only 506 copies were printed in the first run, making them hot commodities today. One signed and personalized book given to the publisher's typesetter has been valued at $27,000. Less sentimental copies generally fetch prices north of $1,000. The sequel, The Light Fantastic, came three years later. Both of these stories take place on the Discworld, a flat planet carried on the backs of four elephants who are standing on a giant turtle flying through space. It serves as a sort of warehouse for genre tropes. There's a wizarding school, witches on broomsticks, werewolf cops, high-speed communication via an international semaphore network, dwarven baking, all your favorite sword and sorcery standbys. 1987 saw the release of Discworld novels 3 and 4, Equal Rights and Mort, both of which were smash hits and sold so well that Pratchett was able to quit his press job and write novels full-time. Mort also represents the series' departure from fast towards a more nuanced relationship between the story and the reader. Now, 1971 to 1987 is a gap of 16 years. Pratchett was working full-time, raising a family, and writing novels simultaneously for 16 solid years before he started selling well enough to focus exclusively on books for his living. If you ever feel discouraged about your own creative endeavors, just know that the world slept on Sir Terry Pratchett's talent for a solid 16 years before giving him the respect he deserved. But why is his work so successful? Well, let's take a closer look. I mentioned already that The Discworld is a fruitcake of genre fiction's best loved tropes, managing to be both loyal to its source material without ever seeming cliché. Pratchett's writing strikes the perfect balance between self-aware parody and enlightened satire. He draws your attention to fantasy's fourth wall through digressive footnotes often nestled two or three recursions deep, but no matter how hard he leans, it never breaks. He crafts worlds which are consistent in their self-contained absurdity by simply thinking logically about things without a logical explanation. He would be the first to tell you a lot of the humor and possibly a lot of the power in the Discworld series comes from thinking logically about those things which we don't normally think logically about or that we just accept. Take for example Rincewines, the wizard protagonist of the first Discworld novel. He is unable to learn any spells because early on in his studies he stumbled across an ancient tome and infected himself with an intensely powerful semi-sentient spell that drives lesser charms out of his mind, fleeing in terror. Magic is a living force in Discworld. It lingers on in the environment after its use. Some spells will even cast themselves in order to avert the death of their host. Pratchett answers fantasy's eternally lingering question of if there are magical beings who can bend reality to their will, why aren't they doing it all the time by modeling them after real-world academics and blocking them in a series of petty bureaucratic disputes whose office politics thwart even the most idealistic ambitions? Because otherwise they turn into power-mad dictators and start hurling fireballs at neighboring cities. At several points in the series he jokes, not doing any magic at all was the chief task of wizards. Ultimately, Pratchett finds a way of grounding even the wildest elements of fantasy in utterly human terms. Death adopts a daughter, the unfeeling and purely logical auditors of reality grow a body and attempt to eat chocolate only for the sensory experience to be so intense it causes their heads to explode. If you take something that exists only to follow logic and you incarnate it in something as illogical as a human body, obviously it's going to struggle to adapt, and that struggle between the innate functional programming of the universe and our capability for thought and feeling marks the central conflict in most of his stories. He knew that the ultimate horizon of fantasy lay not in the conjurations of his own mind, but the exploration of what it means to be a human in a world not explicitly designed around humanity. While the first two books of the series are sequential, the rest of the series shares a loose chronology with books following a rotating cast of recurring characters. You might have seen The Watch, a BBC televised adaptation of the stories surrounding Sir Samuel Vimes and the Angmore Park City Watch. First introduced in the eighth book, Guards, Guards, Vimes is your archetypal beat cop who, through sheer dogged loyalty to his city, accidentally becomes a duke. Along the way, he marries a woman who runs a swamp dragon rescue because it logically follows that a world World with dragon ownership will contain irresponsible owners. Typical boy meets girl with dragon story. His characters manage to be both fully realized while also frequently serving as a satire for some familiar archetypes. For example, Moist von Lipwig is a con artist who, under the threat of being hung a second time, reforms banking and the post office in the space of two books. Going postal and making money offer fascinating insights into how institutions get bogged down with bureaucratic bloat when they stop being accountable to the people they serve. There's also a helping of murder mystery and corporate espionage mixed in. Pratchett is a 
devil of a writer to summarize. Moist is a stand-in for every outsider who's ever dreamed about getting a chance to fix something from the inside. He is in many ways a metaphor for how institutional reform normalizes public services. Specifically in Going Postal, a poorly run, privately owned communications company is taken over and reformed by the post office it made obsolete in a parallel to the early development of telephone lines. Making money satirizes everything economics from the development of paper currency to the concept of inflation. These don't normally sound like rich sources of comedy, but that never once stopped Pratchett. To hear him say it, fantasy potentially gives you a lot of good metaphors to consider, because most current affairs are only ubiquitous, everlasting affairs which turn up again and again in different disguises throughout history. The conflicts in his books never feel artificial or forced, because they're always grounded in the inevitable stresses that arise when society is forced to very suddenly adapt to a new way of doing things. His characters struggle against themselves because they are trying to build mutually incompatible worlds, not because one of them is evil, and that's what evil does. Modernity versus tradition. City slickers versus honest country folk. The power of belief versus the immutability of the world. Death riding a motorcycle while playing a scythe guitar. These are the eternal conflicts all folklore is built upon. Though the Discworld is undeniably what he's most famous for, the work he himself was proudest of was his 2008 young adult novel, Nation. Set in a low fantasy alternate history, it focuses on the struggles of the younger fisherman Mao and the secret princess in exile Ermintrude as they cooperate to survive on a remote island after a devastating tsunami. It's sort of a coming of age, east meets west, post apocalyptic buddy comedy about the importance of cultural preservation and the dangers of Eurocentric anthropology. He described it as the best book I have or will ever write, and that is by no means an overstatement. Pratchett brought the full strength of his studies to bear. Everything he learned about carnivorous plants by growing them in his greenhouse, it's in here. The book contains observations on ecology, the state of natural history research in the 1800s, and why spitting into beer is crucial to fermentation. It's simply a struggle to describe such a nuanced work, and if you've never read Pratchett, you should absolutely start with Nation. Though Pratchett himself said he collaborated as well as a cat, that didn't stop him from teaming up with well-known science writers Jack Cohen and Ian Stewart on The Science of Discworld, a set of four books which blend Pratchett's fantasy with hard science. Framed as the result of a magical experiment gone awry, the four books in the series explore the interactions between the Wizards of the Unseen Academy and the miraculous new universe full of odd round planets that they accidentally created. Though it's framed as fantasy, the science it contains is bedrock solid. You will actually learn something scientific from this book about wizards. It's equal parts educational and hilarious. There's also Good Omens, a collaboration with best friend and occasional inkslinger himself, Neil Gaiman. Written in 1990 over long phone calls and mailed floppy disks, Pratchett described it as arising from the right person, right subject, right time. The story is an examination of the comedy of errors that results after the newborn Antichrist is switched with a random baby and raised like a normal child in the British suburbs. Despite being written by two titans famous for their impressive narrative voices, the work is far greater than just the sum of their commendable parts. Some passages are clearly the fruit of just one hand, but most of the book blends them together perfectly to revel in the full playfulness of language. Maybe you're not in the mood for a novel about a potential apocalypse right now, given everything going on, but if you're curious, it was adapted into a BBC miniseries that finished airing in February of 2020. While he cultivated a twinkly-eyed, jolly persona in public, Pratchett's writing was fueled by a deep-seated anger. In an interview with The Guardian, Gaiman shared a fascinating story about encountering that anger on their promotional tour for Good Omens. Misreading an address, they chose to spend the time between interviews by walking to the radio station for the next appointment. What they assumed would be a short jaunt on a level street instead turned into a hike of several miles over rough terrain. Pratchett grew furious. While Neil was stumbling over how to assuage his friend, Terry responded, Do not underestimate this anger. This anger was the engine that powered Good Omens. If you like either writer, the interview is definitely worth a read. A few years before that story took place, in 1984, Gaiman interviewed Pratchett for Space Voyage magazine. It's mostly unremarkable, save for a casual, offhand claim by Pratchett of having created the world's first talking door, which is not a common boast. Why the whole interview wasn't about that fascinating tidbit escapes explanation, but Pratchett would later clarify in one of his frequent visits to the alt.fan.pratchett newsgroup that he rigged it out of a Z80 computer running speech synthesis software and 
a circuit board harvested from a chemical control plant. It had about a dozen random phrases, including, You have entered a prohibited area, weapons deploy in 10 seconds, and Creek, 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 which was my favorite. It's great fun to look back in time to what the internet was like before social media and realize how little of it has actually changed. For not more than 10 posts after Terry weighed in with the answer, the conversation devolved into an argument about an unrelated subject. Because, of course, it did. A talking door is by no means the coolest thing he ever created in his life. At 62 years of age, he decided to dig up several chunks of iron ore from a field near his house and smelt them in a makeshift kiln fired by sheep manure. And into this iron, which would eventually be made into a sword, he added several pieces of literal meteorite. You know, space metal, the kinds that heroes use to slay villains. And why did the famous fantasy author decide to make him a probably magic sword fit for one of his own heroes? Well, that was because the queen knighted him. Now, Pratchett would be the first person in a conversation to downplay the scale of his own success, having once said, The reason I make the sales is that everything I've written is in print and still selling very well, and every new book adds to it, and the whole huge thing just keeps rumbling onward. But try as he might, he eventually started attracting the attention of the gatekeepers of the literary establishment. His first outright win was the 1990 British Sci-Fi Association Award for Pyramids, a novel about a pyramid so large it threw an entire country out of time-space alignment. His subsequent works would go on to attract continued attention, frequently ranking high in the Locus Awards. After two nominations in 2002, he finally won the Carnegie Medal Award for The Amazing Morris and his Educated Rodents, the Discworld's response to The Pied Piper of Hamlin. This was the first Discworld novel written specifically for younger readers, and the Carnegie would go on to become his most treasured award due to the fact that it was given to him by teachers and librarians, people who could see firsthand the impact that his work had on a young audience. His acceptance speech is a must-read, with brilliant observations on the importance of humor and fantasy, like laughter can get through the keyhole while seriousness is still hammering on the door. New ideas can ride in on the back of a joke. Old ideas can be given an added edge. That same year, it also have an asteroid named after him. Busy fellow. He was one of the few men ever listed in the Amelia Bloomer book list for feminist writing, with the 2004 Tiffany Aiken story, The We Free Men. The Aiken line of stories would go on to become some of his most frequently awarded. As I teased before, in 1998, he was designated an officer of the British Empire for his services to literature. Of course, he was humble about it, writing to Ansible magazine, I suspect the services to literature consisted of refraining from trying to write any. Still, I can't help feeling mighty chuffed about it. In 2009, this was followed up with by a full-on queen official knighting. So of course he needed a sword, and of course it had to be made by him with meteorites. And England being as they are with blades, he had to hide it from the constabulary. A hidden meteorite masterwork, probably magical sword, owned by a knight of the pen. Dungeon masters, take note, as next week's plot hook, courtesy of Terry Pratchett's actual life. Two thousand and seven saw the release of Discworld novel Thirty Six, Making Money, which earned a Nebula nomination and won the Locus Award. It was also the year Sir Terry made public his diagnosis of posterior cortical atrophy, a rare form of Alzheimer's disease that targets the back of the brain. He would go on to donate a million dollars to the Alzheimer's Research Trust and even volunteered his own body for experimental treatments. He was public with his struggles in the last few years of his life, scaling back his touring and convention schedule and no longer dedicating the books he signed for fans. In 2008, he recorded a two-part series for the BBC, Terry Pratchett, Living with Alzheimer's. It's an unflinching look at a brutal disease from an intensely unique perspective. It won a BAFTA award and drew in 2.6 million extremely ready-to-be-depressed viewers. As the disease progressed, he began advocating for assisted suicide, saying, I believe it should be possible for someone stricken with a serious and ultimately fatal illness to choose to die peacefully with medical help rather than suffer. If this topic is upsetting to you, you'll probably want to skip forward a few minutes right now until you see the next title screen. It was on that same subject he delivered the 2010 BBC Richard Dimbleby lecture, Shaking Hands with Death. Though he was able to read the introduction, he left the body of the text to his friend Tony Robinson. The lecture is, as everything Pratchett ever wrote, beautiful and moving and full of profound insights. But it's not easy to watch someone you respect grapple with the prospect of their own imminent mortality. 
He followed that up the next year with another BBC documentary, Terry Pratchett, Choosing to Die. It features Terry interviewing patients and employees of the Dignitas Clinic, an assisted suicide institution in Zurich, Switzerland. He also discusses the indignities of terminal diseases and his thoughts on mortality, specifically the prospect of ending his own life. You also witness on camera a patient ingest a lethal amount of phenobarbital. It's a deeply upsetting scene in a very important work, and if you choose to seek it out, know that you will see someone die. It's not light viewing, but if you want to understand how assisted suicide works from the inside out, there is no more thorough source. On March 12, 2015, Terry Pratchett died of natural causes. He was 66 years old, survived by his wife, Lynn, and his daughter, Rihanna. Discworld 41, The Shepherd's Crown, was released posthumously on August the 27th. It's the sixth Tiffany Aching story, and it's the last Discworld novel that's ever going to be released. According with Pratchett's wishes, his hard drive was placed in the middle of a street in the Great Dorset Steam Festival and flattened with a steamroller. Many Discworld fans have mourned what they feel was lost with that flattening, including as many as ten unfinished titles. But those books weren't ever real. They never belonged to anyone but Pratchett, and he just wasn't ready to give them to the world. Far too often, the unfinished works of a beloved author are polished up by a hired hand and sold to an audience of mourners. We obviously don't need to name names here, but there's a reason they keep remaking the original Dune. Who on earth is qualified to fill Sir Terry's shoes? Who has his rage at the injustices of the world, his love of human foibles, his adoration of nature? He was, simply, a once-in-a-generation talent, and we were lucky to get as many books out of him as we did. 41 Discworlds, 4 Science of Discworlds, Good Omens, Nation, many others I didn't even mention, like the five co-written titles in the Long Earth series, every single one of them an exercise in the joy of imagination. Terry took advantage of every day of work his talent brought him, and he'd want us to do the same. Thanks for the good times, Terry. And I really hope you found that video interesting and inspirational. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. Thank you for watching.